Good evening. Glad to see you here, Mihai. I'm excited to hear from you tonight. One of the best things about uh, We Are One United is that we want to take opportunity to introduce uh, people and resources that are in our community that can really help our clients, our community to improve. So welcome. I'm going to turn it back over to Zubair to handle uh, the rest of the introduction and the evening. And thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. This is see you, Mr. John Epps. We appreciate your commitment to our community and to us as your staff. Uh, Mr. Mihai, the topic, as everyone is saying, why investing in emission-driven organizations capacity is a priority. Uh, our guest, although I'm going just to say a few words, but really is really interesting and very nice to me because he's a, uh, my mentor because I've been going through the training, dream fund, and so on. I'm so really excited and we appreciate your effort helping the communities. Your services are really very, very important to us. And I would like to ask you to take on to start your presentation by introducing yourself because I can introduce you, but you can introduce yourself better than I can do. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Zubair, for uh for inviting me and um, we, we had a lot of conversations prior to this call about our work in general and we are glad to have uh, your organizations part, organizations part of the Dream Fund and provide access to some of the funding that the state is providing to, to start up uh, startup organizations in uh, in California and especially in the Inland Empire. So uh, really happy to be here. Um, ju just uh, before I uh, say a few things about myself, I just want to um, uh, talk a bit about the organizations that I'm that I co-founded and I'm its uh, current executive director. Uh, the name might seem weird. Uh, we get a lot of um, weird, uh, interesting questions. So it's Caravanserai project. And um, Caravanserai, it's actually um, um, a compound noun. It's caravan, and everyone knows what a caravan is, right? In the desert, camels are going from one location to the other. Uh, Sarai is... Um, uh, Persian uh, word of Persian origin, and it means actually the place where the caravans were meeting and trading goods and exchanging information, and then they were continuing their journey. So it was a safe sp space in the desert or al along trade routes where these travelers were meeting and spending the night. So the metaphor that we decided to go for uh, when um, we went for Caravanserai as a as the name of the organization was creating a platform, creating a space, physical space initially, now virtual space, where entrepreneurs, uh, mission-driven entrepreneurs, small business owners are um, using that space, that platform along their uh, their professional, their entrepreneurial journey and get resources, get information, connect with other people. And I think the um, um, this funding that our organization has been able to, uh, to provide to other uh, peer organizations in the region and not only it's exact, I probably the best example of, of that kind of interaction and, uh, and support. Um, just a bit about myself, organization. The organization was created in 2016, uh, and it was it is incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit. We started working in uh, the region in 2018 when we launched our first uh, partnership with UCR Riverside. 
I'm also uh, an entrepreneur in residence uh, with an office for technology partnership at UC Riverside. And my focus is on social impact. Prior to getting into mission-driven work, entrepreneurship and social ent entrepreneurship, I've been working for a very long time in foreign affairs, diplomacy, and uh, whether it was with the State Department in Washington, D.C., or uh, in my uh, country, Romania, I was a career diplomat with the, foreign, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I also launched a couple of social enterprises internationally and been part of different social enterprises, especially in the maker sector. And I'm by that, I mean artisans and producers. And that has been in Guatemala, spent a lot of time working with different organizations. And my background is more on international relations, foreign affairs. And I graduated from Central European University in Hungary and uh, Johns Hopkins in, in Washington, DC, my, my graduate uh, uh, programs. And when Zubair and I were talking about, you know, what should we uh, talk about as we are having coffee and I just finished mine, uh, was, you know, obviously, uh, it's there's a lot of conversation around the impact of the, what small businesses have when where nonprofits are uh, are placed within this conversation and what actual impact they have in the in communities they are part of or on different groups. So we we uh, he went back to um, an article that I published in the Desert Sun and it was really about uh, why organic why both um, funders and organizations themselves should focus on investing and developing their uh, infrastructure, their, their own capacity. And that was, um, I think exactly, or more than a year ago. And it was really the result of the work that we were doing and this uh, reluctance, especially from the donors of, providing funding and foundations and not only private dollars donors, but foundations and different uh, organizations that are supporting um, mission driven, especially nonprofits, providing financial support to organizations to build their own infrastructure, not necessarily funding for um, programming, but for the organization itself, for staff, for different uh, technologies that they need. And during, you know, throughout, throughout the conversations that we have been having, it was this reluctance of um, providing this type of support. Everyone wants to invest in programming and programs because that's how they think. Uh, they achieve more impact. And we've seen that in uh, funding that comes from the state. They don't want to provide um, cover, uh, you know, have a budget line that is uh, for overhead or indirect expenses. That's very rare. And that I think puts a lot of pressure on organizations, whatever their, uh, whatever the type we are talking about and regardless of their work, because you cannot, implement and develop good quality, impactful and long-term programs if you as an organization uh, are starving and you don't have resources and your staff is underpaid, but the, the expectation is for them to long work hours and so on. Uh, but before you know, we have this conversation, just a bit about why, why as an organization, we are talking about mission-driven enterprise and not nonprofit or not social enterprise. We really found that uh, there is a bias against, uh, when you talk about social enterprise, nonprofits are, are I think, traditionally excluded uh, because it's hard for a lot of people, hopefully um, uh, less than before, to think about a nonprofit organization as generating revenue. And you know, traditionally that's the expectation from a social enterprise, generate revenue and provide social impact. 
At the other end, there are for-profit organizations that traditionally are not seen as um, providing or achieve, generating social impact. It's more about um, equity. It's about for-profit work. While you know, at the other uh, end, there are nonprofits that, as I mentioned, uh, we think of nonprofits as organizations that are just doing social impact work. They don't have business plans. They are not, we don't even consider them small businesses. So when, because we want, we saw that there is this need, that this new conversation about uh, social good uh, in general, that having this more, um, a different label and a different name for organizations that regardless of their legal structure, whether they are a for-profit or a non-profit or other type of uh, incorporation, legal incorporations, they are, if they are mission driven, that's all, you know, that, that's their common denominator. And the other thing is, by using uh, the word enterprise, somehow it implies there is a revenue generating. Uh, so mixing the mission driven, the social impact part with the enterprise idea, we kind of uh, focusing on organizations, ventures, as I mentioned, regardless of their legal status that are both mission driven and both for profit. Pro, for profit driven, and we are not talking about equity and uh, you know sharing profit within the partners. That's really more about the legal structure of the organization and how that is uh, how that is set up. Um, and why we think you know it is important to talk about this um, less attractive part of the social impact and mission driven work, which is the capacity, the you know capacity building of an organization, is that these organizations are you know they are providing jobs. They are, and COVID has demonstrated how important social impact or ventures and for-profit ventures, how important they are because especially during the early days of COVID, they were the only ones that were providing social services from healthcare, childcare, mental health, education, you name it, uh, food banks, everything was, um, you know, there, there was not on top of the pressure that was uh, generated by, uh, by COVID, the, these services continue to be provided to underserved communities, uh, underserved groups uh, by this type, by these organizations that they, you know, traditionally did not invest in their capacity, in their infrastructure. So more than ever, you know, as we are moving away from COVID, rethinking the way we are structuring our organization and, you know, at my at our organization, that's our approach as well. How do we offer more programs or uh, serve more beneficiaries in beneficiaries, but in the same time build that capacity, internal capacity, to actually be able to deliver the work? And also, these organizations they are a huge contributor to the economy through the, you know, the um, uh, taxes that they pay uh, or, uh, you know, healthcare and all this kind of um, economic input they, they bring uh, to the general uh, state or federal infrastructure. And at the end of the day, uh, mission-driven organizations are uh, have, uh, you know, are building and consolidating the economic and social human infrastructure in general. So if their contribution focuses on that, their infrastructure should also be a priority for us, whether we work for these organizations or we are funding organizations that are a part of the mission-driven uh, mission driven sector. Uh, and I think you know we are also thinking about what kind of business model this 
a mix of organism. Uh, uh, this this model should be um, adopted in order to uh, both provide social achieve and generate social impact, but be financially sustainable. And I, I think it's really up to the uh, founders or those that start these businesses to really figure out if they wanna be a for-profit or a non-profit organization, legally speaking. And from our perspective, I think what works best is really to run these organizations and build them as a for-profit and have in mind generating revenue. And we are not talking about, uh, you know, building uh, equity for the funders uh, because for the founders, because that's not the, the main goal. It's but to be able to sustain the social impact we want to achieve. And on the other end, it's really think in terms of impact as a nonprofit and a focus on the beneficiary, focus on the customer, uh, and really try to become, provide innovative solutions and reach those that are in need for the services we, we provide. And I think that leads to think creatively about the sources of revenue or funding that we are using to uh, support such a model. And also, you know, if we are thinking, oh, we need to increase the number of beneficiaries and the number of people we serve in the same time think, oh, we need to generate more revenue in order to be sustainable and um, have us uh, provide stable ongoing uh, impact. Um, you know, the mid and long-term planning, that's I think it's key for this type of approach because a lot of the social impact programs, whatever they are, from food banks to childcare, I, I think you know every the expectation of funders and foundations who are investing in this type of work is to have long term programs, and I, I think you know it's unless there is a long term plan for the organization, it's hard to implement long term plans at uh, that have the impact that, that we are planning to deliver. And also there is the pressure when it comes to funders that are more interested in, in programs uh, to increase the number of uh, customers, to increase the number of beneficiaries. So growth and scaling should also be, should focus not only on the social impact, but also on the financial part. I think those two are related uh, you know what they say: if, no money, no mission. You cannot, uh, you you can bootstrap up to a point, but long term is not sustainable uh, because your staff will decide to leave if they are not appreciated, and it becomes a lot of people. Most of the people in the uh, this sector get involved because they are passionate. And we recently hired somebody that left a very comfortable position because he was tired and he really didn't see how he's contributing uh, to anything. It was just, you know, things that he had to do. And he, he joined our team because he was looking to also give back and see that his work is translated into something that is meaningful to him, but also to the community at large. And I think, you know, that's, a, I think is the perfect example of um, folks, professionals working in this sector and the passion and the interest for social impact is dominant, but also they, they have to be rewarded financially and professionally for their work. And that's only possible if the organization is, is strong. Uh, and the other element, whether I think, regardless of whether we are asking for funding or um, for infrastructure or for programming, everyone wants to know, you know, how do we how do we evaluate impact? What are the results, and how do we monitor all this? So it, it's not. I think monitoring and evaluation um, it goes both ways. 
uh, whether we want to have more money for programming or we want to have more money for our own infrastructure. Uh, please interrupt me if uh, you know, I have a conversation around that. Uh, and I think this, this dilemma uh, between programs and infrastructure, what should we fund first? Is it the chicken and the egg? And I think, you know, especially for, for a startup, do you seek money for, for the organization or you just start a program and then you figure it out? And, and I think that changes from, it's case by case, it really depends on the organization and who is part of it, what, because sometimes, you know, you, there is a great idea and you, you know it will work and you're looking for funding. And the answer is, do you have a proof of concept? Well, I can't have a proof of concept because I have no funding to implement it. And, uh, you know, it's easier, I think, in the tech industry when you have some tech product uh, to get funding for something that is just on paper, right? I mean, people are more willing to give money for that and willing to say, okay, I lost, you know, uh, my investment, uh, but, I, I never heard of somebody saying, okay, I'm investing or I fund a, a mission-driven organization, especially if it's a nonprofit and see if it works or not. That never happens. They always want numbers. They always want to have, you know, qualitative and quantitative data. So finding that, um, you know, balance or finding the right, funder and foundation and even whether maybe like it would be a private investor uh, to really, you know, see the vision and say, yes, I'm going to fund this for a pilot project and see if it ha what happens. And, you know, we, we've been struggling with that as well. And I think th this approach that the state of California has with programs like the Dream Fund, where they are just Obviously, five or ten k it's not a big investment, uh, but I think the fact that there are no restrictions uh, and that there is no pressure that you have to be in it's really a bet that the state is it's a risk that the state is willing to to take and see if these startups are uh, with the funding that they receive are willing to uh, will will uh, will grow. So, and obviously, um, I think again, in the mission driven sector, the pressure is way higher. And what, you know, we all know the expectation from uh, purely for profit businesses, startups that have a one product, they, they only have to focus on one thing. Well, when it comes to the mission driven organizations, you have to consider 10 things at a time, uh, the program, uh, the beneficiaries, uh, monitoring and evaluation, seek funding, and the expectation that you are good at everything you do, right? But when you have, especially in the tech industry, all the expectation is uh, for you to just know the tech part and they will bring advisors and they will bring investors and resources that hardly happens in the mission-driven sector. You have to struggle and just, especially if at the beginning you are one person show, uh, you have to figure out everything. And, you know, there are all these reports about, uh, especially that UCR is, has been providing the Center for Social Innovation or the state of innovation in the Inland Empire. There, there is a, and they talk about, uh, you know, there are uh, uh, a very big number of nonprofits, uh, legally incorporated nonprofits in the Inland Empire. I think the number they are sharing is like maybe 11,000, 14,000 uh, nonprofit legally incorporated in the Inland Empire. But the percentage of these organizations that are actually in business and doing work active, it's very small. Because I think from the beginning, they, uh, they are not supported. If they might have great solutions that will really change the dynamic in the community, the dynamic in the particular group, 
but they it's very hard to get seed funding or seed grants, seed investments for this type of organizations. Uh, because you know it's a risk that I think no one wants to to take and uh, private donors or uh, private you know foundations, they always ask, let me see what you have done. And just I think the best example is that a lot of the funding, the community foundation, the Inland Empire Community Foundation is offering for a lot of their funding, they request at least three years of activity, uninterrupted activity. So you need to demonstrate that you have filed your taxes, that you have programming programs that have been implemented. So I think, you know, this uh, pressure on mission-driven entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, it, it, it's, it's very, uh, it's ongoing and uh, uh, unfortunately, I think, you know, will continue to, to be that way. Um, and when it, I, I think, you know, when it comes to investing in the capacity of such organization, in the infrastructure of such organizations, the, both programming implementation, the organizational culture and by organizational mean, well-being, I really mean the staff and uh, the health, both financially and mental health of the organization, but also the sustainability should really be at the same level with the impact that the organization is achieving with the system change approaches and the number of beneficiaries. Uh, and put this to on the same level, especially when it comes to asking for funding and really paint a picture that it's clear to those on the other side of the table or of the Zoom call that are uh, potential funders and investor and see that it's the chicken and the egg thing. You cannot have good impact if you don't have money to implement the program. You cannot achieve system change if the programs that you are designing are not um, uh, comprehensive and are not, um, they don't have the resources to implement them. You know, the, it might look like the greatest program on paper if you don't have the resources to actually implement them and eventually um, generate the impact. Everyone wants to talk about system change. And, and we, you know, this is something that we have seen in our case and a lot of um, uh, instances where funders or those that we were pitching for, you know, different projects were, well, we, we are not covering indirect costs. So your expectation is that we have an account that is just there and will actually provide the funding that you are not, you know, the bills and the rent or, you know, Zoom memberships and all these kind of things you're not willing to cover. You're only interesting in the end product, which is the impact. So I think, you know, making sure that we are all, sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not, but being able to actually make a case and even if they are not funding this time, you know, indirect costs or overhead, at least make them understand that these expenses are as important as the program itself. And uh, make a case for if we have money and we have the right staff to run the organization and implement those projects, then we are sustainable and relevant so our work and beneficiaries will uh, will take advantage of what we do. And it's, sometimes what we have seen is that obviously everyone or most of the funders jump for, yeah, we are going to give money for products, for the consultants or for, um, you know, to serve the beneficiaries. But sometimes there are other programs that we can, you know, share the cost of, 10% uh, from the rent will be covered by one program, 10% by the other program and so on. And literally, you know, tell them that this is how a, a good strategy that will give us, you know, will balance uh, the pressure 
And the, the other thing that we have done is leverage the fund. There are some instances and the, we have been developing a good relationship with the Office of Small Business Advocate and their policy is they never fund overhead and in order to get their funding, you need to have matching grant dollar to dollar. That is specifically for a, sim, for a similar program. How many organizations have that? It's very, you know, it, it doesn't happen often. That's why they always fund the same entities, the same big organizations, because they have the funding from other resources. So what we started pitching and, you know, did, I think they liked the idea was, well, we are not going to develop a new program with the money that you're giving us. We already have the program. But what we are going to use your funds is to, to improve that program, to scale it. And you will let the cover, you'll only cover the contractors. So we, this way, we use other funding to cover other costs. And they really like that because what, my, you know, what we saw, they don't want to fund or different or particular organizations, they don't want to fund new programs. They are willing to fund existing programs and contribute to the expenses. And that's how we have been managed uh, to save funds that would go for contractors, for example, and use other funds that were only for contractors. So that has given us some, some balance. Um, and there's also the scenario that we have been using. If we don't have funding for um, capacity, then we have no results. And I think being able to show, to show that, or if you give us funding to capacity to hire a new program manager, we can double uh, the beneficiaries that we are gonna serve. And I think every time we are using numbers and be, we are able to show, you know, we need somebody to work 40 hours a week on this program and the moment we have that person, the number of beneficiaries, the number your money will, the number of people, the, your money, your grant will support will double because we will have a person that will only do that. That change, sometimes changes the conversation. And, you know, we, we have an instance where they said, yeah, you know, we cannot fund this, but we can actually have another program. And I think, you know, we can fund your uh, infrastructure from there. Uh, so that, you know, obviously it's not, it's not always working. And finally, I, I think, you know, this idea of if and, you know, then, uh, well, I think that that's a typo in then there, um, it's giving them, um, you know, making them confirming that the organization is here for long term. And this is not something, oh, we have a program and then we'll switch to somebody else. You know, I keep hearing from donors or when we are doing fundraising that no one wants to write the, the last check. And with that check, unless, you know, it's a one year program, that's it. Uh, but especially when it comes to private donors and even organizations, they always want to see that um, first of all, they are not supporting 100% of that program, that they are part of a group, other people, other organizations have invested in you, and that there is this program will grow bigger, will have more impact, will get better at how they are serving people. So they feel that their, their investments are... Um, uh, well, well managed and well used. And I think, you know, going back to this idea of mission driven organizations being a mix of for profit, social enterprise, for profit, I, I think it's more and more the pressure on or the expectation of funders, foundations that they are investors and there is a return on their investment. And that can be, uh, you know, obviously cannot be in funds, in money, because that's not um, 
uh, what this sector is about, but the returns on investment is about seeing change in communities or uh, increasing the numbers of, of beneficiaries and how you know that's something that will continue to grow. And I think that was the end of my little um, uh, <laughs> conversation so, or monologue. So yeah, I mean, any thoughts? Obviously we are, I, I don't think it's, we are in the process of figuring out ourselves. And I think, you know, we are going through a process with our board currently of rethinking how we, not necessarily how, I think we, we figure out a recipe for programming and how the implementation and, but we have not figured out the infrastructure part. And I, I think, you know, we need to balance that in terms of um, you know, how do we support the infrastructure that we need in order to uh, create the programs and deliver the programs that we offer. And I, I was on a, uh, I'm part of an incubator um, uh, this month and, you know, we, they were, we were talking about financial growth and, you know, how growth, you know, having growth and scaling can both be, uh, bring a lot of advantages, but can also, and most of the people who are in this program are for-profit businesses, um, how growth can also kill an organization. Because, and, it's, and I think, you know, that's very real in the mission-driven sector, social enterprise sector, nonprofits, you want to do more, right? Literally is this, I don't want to say the savior syndrome, uh, but really, you know, genuinely you want to support more and more people, especially if the solutions you're offering have positive results. But, and we, I think, uh, we ignore the pressure that we put on the organization. And we stretch way too far than we can afford. Uh, so I think you know, expanding programs, and we've seen that in many cases can really cripple an organization. And at the end of the day, I think it's about you know kill, having no results, uh, trying to do more. Uh, the risk is that the run, um, a runway can get very short and we, we can lose that, uh, you know, control of the plane very, very fast. Uh, and I think, you know, there's nothing more disappointing than having an organization that is doing great work and not being able to support itself. And I think there's always the pressure there, always, uh, you know, how do you balance that? And, and, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, John, you have, you know, been in this sector for a very long time and you have a lot of experience. <laughs> Maybe you have, uh, you discovered some solutions there and recipes for, uh, for success or things, at least things that you have tested, tried, might not have worked and we should not do, or should we, you, we, you know, just uh, save resources of not, you know, go on using recipes that have failed, which I think, you know, at the end of the day, that's about creating a community and having these uh, meetings, literally learning from other people what worked when, what not, what has not worked and just avoid those mistakes. You know, Mihai, two, two thoughts came to my mind as I was listening. I think one, when you look at a system that isn't working, um, you know, it, the old saying, you know, you, you can't keep doing the same thing and expect to get a different result. And I think often we have two problems. One, we have um, people who don't get into this with the skills and commitment to develop the capacity and those things. Partially, you, you don't know what you don't know. So I think changing that awareness is really important. Yeah. And I think that's one of the big things that Caravanserite does try to do is, you know, really like a nonprofit, 
is a business. I mean, it, I it think, is. and I think too often there's still this sense that it's not. I think, however, if you place that uh, kind of uh, responsibility on them to be a business, then I also think funders have to treat you like a business. Yes. And I think if you had any business, you wouldn't start it without an investment. That's and true. if people are not <laughs> willing to invest, then yeah. you can't run the business. I think most people assume that that we will do it anyway. You know, I remember one time I was in a meeting in Mihai and I cringed because um, we were talking about funding and, and this was several years ago. And one of the things that one of the people in the group said was, well, you know, with nonprofits, we know how to do more with less. And I said, absolutely not. No yeah, one can do yeah. more with less. That's, a, that's one of those things that, cause you to get yourself in trouble and and then we just like you know i was listening to uh darren hardy talk about investment and he said he had invested one hundred fifty thousand dollars into a project and he expected a good return and then he found out it wasn't going to be a great return for the project and so the person came to me and said but if you invest another fifty thousand dollars we'll we'll be able to get a return, you'll be able to get a return of money. And I think we don't understand how to properly analyze that, especially yeah. as nonprofits. If you study it in one sense, you would think, well, let's try the $50,000 and see what happens. Darren Hardy said, no, as a business person, you would not invest another 50. You would just consider the $150,000 a sunk cost. It's a write-off. And you would say that's that's over because the sensitive nature of the work that we do, if you say we're going to write it off, we, we're talking about drug addiction and homelessness and, you know, disease. So so we don't feel comfortable making the proper rational business decision. And I feel like, unfortunately, Funders take advantage of that. And people keep trying to make, you know, the old saying was you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. We keep trying to make silk purses yep. out of sow's ears. So two things that I hope we can do together. One, I think better educate business people, better educated business people out of nonprofits and have them actually treat it like business. I hate going to a bank because they'll say, well, we only, we'll fund small businesses, but not a nonprofit. Yes. I'm like, the, the nonprofit is a small business. Or so, if they are willing to, they ask for so many things yes. that they are they are not, they will never ask from a small a, business. A small owner. business. So, so that's, that's kind of duplicitous and needs to be dealt with. So I think there's, got to be some overhaul in the investment side of this business so that we have a fair chance to compete. Because I think the other part of it is actually there is a great return on the work that we do if we could do it, but we don't get a chance to really do it and, and grow it in a, in a way that would be sustainable and that literally, I think, would give a return on the investment. So I think that the work that is yet to be done is, again, first of all, really educating um, the, the providers. But I also think it's got to be changing uh, the, the funders. And, yeah, and that, that's important. That, that, that's true. And I think, you know, a lot of um, folks that are, starting in the, you know, the mission driven uh, sector, uh, you know, they are genuinely passionate about, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, it's their personal experience has been their, you know, their community or things that they have a very personal connection to. And I think the expectation internally, we think that, oh, if I'm passionate about this, 
other people will follow me and will give their support. And we realize that it's not true. But also, I, I think, you know, it's all, uh, uh, that's one thing. And the other thing, you know, that, that might be true if we m m maybe al along with the passion for a specific cause, we also, as you said, John, think it as a business. And I think that maybe will give more courage to uh, the others, wherever they are, to support that business. And I, I really, you know, like, like this idea of return on investment. And I, I think, you know, the Palm Springs and the homeless situation is, it's really a great example. Businesses that are complaining that there are homeless people everywhere and that they cannot have attract more customers, especially on some parts of the city uh, because they are homeless everywhere. What if they would change their mind when it comes to supporting nonprofits, working with homeless people and fund them because the work of these nonprofits, yeah, might not happen overnight, but maybe shorter, faster than they would expect they will take care or, you know, find a solution for the homeless people that in a way prevent customers to come to them and for those businesses to generate more revenue. So I think, you know, it's really a, obviously a, a lot of education on both sides. The funder needs to understand, yeah, I'm actually, if I give you money and you might not give me the double, but I will be able to build a better business. Uh, the, my restaurant will have more customers because you will help me with a problem that me as a restaurant cannot deal with. It's not what I'm good at. So I think, you know, having that conversation, but also I think with the pressure on the uh, nonprofit sector, the mission delivery sector is really pitch that, um, uh, you know, ask for funding also as, a, you know, as if they were in front of, you know, a real investor. Well, and it's a real investor. You know, that's the... It, 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 well, I, I think, you know... Yeah, right. I think you're, I think you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're spot on. I think it has to be both. And I think it has to be honest. You know, I think another side is just, you know, if... You know, am I am I doing this work so that I get a paycheck, or am I doing this work so that I really change and and hopefully er eradicate a problem, which may mean that I'm I'm putting myself out of business in the long run. Well, you know what? That's a great idea. So I think too often this idea of sustainability. You know, you know, you have enough to hold on and suffer for many years. I would rather just feast and figure it out or 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 starve. But this this prolonged agony of you know how we drag it out, we never give quite enough to really solve the right. problem. It's either do we really have the heart, the intention to solve the problem? I think one of the other players, and when I talk about funders, I probably should be uh careful, but I think. One of the other players and I could really be taking a hold, but is government, right? Oh, I think totally. I think we we collect taxes. We should use those revenues as startup funds, as investment, as you know, we're we're asking for investment from the local government in what it wants to achieve in terms of safer healthier, more prosperous community. So we, we you know, I, I think, again, getting those, maybe having a leveraged agreement between the city or state or county and the other sources of revenue, the banks, and also businesses. I think everybody, and, and I think it cannot be just in the hands of a few philanthropists who, you know, are making decisions based on kind of their interests or 
their trauma they've gone through, which, right. you know, I'm, I'm appreciative that they, they are willing to give. <laughs> but if that's the driver, then we're in trouble. So I think um, I've seen a model where community has invested um, and, and actually raised funds that became capital that then were leveraged into um, actual, you know, revenues. And that program, as I understand it, um, is still going strong and it was started back in the 60s. Um, I think we have to um, have the trust within the community to do the work, to, to support, you know, making their communities better too. I think unfortunately too often it's like everybody looks for somebody else to fix the problem. I think it's got to be a shared responsibility within the community and with the organizations. And, and I want to say that, you know, um, conversations like this and opportunities like this, we, we just have to have to get out with that message much more. And what you don't hear tonight did is help to bring that out. And I, I think, you know, earlier you mentioned the fact that um, mission-driven organizations are, or those that are involved in the sector are willing to uh, work with very little. If, you know, they solicit funds and they receive half of what they, are re they have requested, oh, you know, I'll struggle, I, uh, I, I just do it anyway. And I think that's a wrong approach because the second year or the second time you go, you cannot ask for more than you've given because they know you will do it for less. So they will even cut more than they have given you the first time. And, you know, it, we are talking about equal pay in other sectors. We are talking about people having benefits and, you know, health insurance and so on. How many nonprofit organizations don't have health, don't offer health insurance for their staff or don't offer any benefits and the pay is very low. So I, I think, you know, that's like an internal, um, you know, to look at the organizations, you can not expect your staff and your team to do great work if they, if you treat them or the sector treats them less than the, you know, the beneficiary. So you are, how can you help somebody if you're struggling at home or if you're struggling at, of course you leave the sector and you, because I think, you know, it's a, at one point becomes a survival thing. You cannot, no matter how passionate you are about uh, social impact, you leave because you need to pay rent and you need to pay bills and so on. No, I think, yeah. I think we touched on it. I want to say two things. One, thank you. I mean, I, I think you laid out the, the idea. I think what, what I would like us to do, obviously, is have you come back and, and continue the conversation. I think it would be in our best interest to include some of those entities we've, we've mentioned so that they begin to also participate in the community. Yeah. And, and, and I want to suggest there are uh, several organizations out there that are creating equity funds and investment funds, um, especially that focus on people of color and those kinds of things. But at the same time, um, there's, there's so much more that could be done. And so uh, I know we're, we're at our time limit for tonight. But first and foremost, again, I want to thank you for thank you for coming and, and setting the stage. I, I don't feel like like we we've gotten the conversation going yet, <laughs> but I think we are setting the stage. Um, and and I want to thank you for doing that very uh, adroitly. Um, thank you. I think yeah, it, it's a conversation that should not end soon. I mean, it should if we find a solution, but otherwise, it should not end. That's I think it's it uh, uh, it, it should uh, keep on going. 